Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Susan Shand and John Russell. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Susan Shand. Milagros Sotelo had plans to travel from South America to Tennessee to work at Ober Gatlinburg Ski Resort this winter. The 22-year-old student worked the last two winters in the equipment rental store at the small resort in the Smoky Mountains. She wanted to see old friends as well as improve her English. She also wanted to take a break from law school in Lima, Peru, where she lives. But on June 22nd, President Donald Trump signed an executive order temporarily barring many foreign worker visas. It includes the J-1 visas that South American students often get to come to North America during their summer break. Sotelo had to cancel her plans. Now she is trying to find a job in Lima. Ski resorts are trying to operate safely during the coronavirus pandemic. Measures like face coverings and social distancing are required. But Trump's order has added another problem. How to get enough workers. Trump argued that foreigners are a risk to American workers as the country tries to restart its economy. American workers compete with millions of aliens who enter the United States to perform temporary work, the order states. It will expire at the end of 2020. But Sotelo argues that there are lots of jobs at or near ski resorts. Industry leaders agree. They say it is difficult to fill temporary jobs with American workers. A big part of the reason is, and this is true even during COVID, most Americans want a year-round job, said Dave Bird. He is a director at the National Ski Areas Association, NSAA. Bird said between 7,000 and 8,000 J-1 workers fill jobs at many of the country's 470 ski resorts every winter. Another 1,000 to 2,000 workers come to U.S. resorts on H-2B visas. Those are also barred by Trump's order. In total, foreign guest workers make up around 7% of the workforce at U.S. ski resorts, Bird said. Those workers, he said, are very important. In July, the NSAA released a report that said just over 50% of the 202 ski resorts questioned said they could not find enough workers for the 2019-2020 winter season. Bird said it is also hard to find workers because many ski resorts are in rural areas with costly housing. Well-known ski areas like Vail and Telluride in Colorado, Taos in New Mexico, and Jackson Hole in Wyoming are very costly to live in, Bird noted. 
Vail Resorts owns 33 ski areas in the country. It has always used foreign workers. Now it is looking in local communities to find workers for this winter. They have found that American college students are interested in these jobs now because they are not living on college campuses. The coronavirus crisis permits them to take their studies with them to a ski resort. As for hiring Americans, we have been pleased with the results so far, said Vail Resorts spokesman Ryan Huff. But small resorts are worried about their opening day. At Ober Gatlinburg, student workers from Brazil, Peru, and the Dominican Republic usually fill about 150 jobs. Many small resorts often have unfilled jobs, but it's become very critical now, said Jerry Husky. He has worked for the resort for 20 years and usually spent September and October hiring foreign students. Husky started hiring workers on J-1 visas in the mid-1990s after a strong economy made it hard to hire Americans. Over the years, the numbers grew among foreign students. It's a good exchange of information and cultures. They want to see what goes on in the U.S., Husky said. We're losing out on having them, he added. I'm Susan Shand. How can teachers best lead language classes, special education classes, or communications classes while protecting themselves and their students? This fall... American teachers are considering that very question. With some students coming back to school for classes, teachers have begun experimenting with unusual objects, special kinds of masks or face coverings, and even protective bubbles. Stephanie Wanzer is a teacher who works with special education students in Fairfield County, Connecticut. Special education is a term for classes with students who have special needs because of physical or learning issues. While teaching, Wanser says she would like students to see her smile so that they know she is happy, but they cannot see her face because of her mask. Instead, Wanzar uses an unusual object, a stick with an image of a smile. Wanzar recently described working with one student to the Associated Press. I try to be really expressive with my eyes, she said. He's looking at me, and I'm not sure if he thinks I'm mad or happy, because you can't see my mouth smiling she said. So I actually have a smile on a stick, which is bizarre, but it's a smile like, look, I'm smiling. John Resendez is a teacher in Irvine, California. He teaches civics, the study of the rights and duties of citizens, and of how government works. His classes started online this year, but now that some students are returning to school, he worries about how masks will affect his classes. Part of what I do as a civics teacher is to teach people to engage in civic conversations, he said. A conversation is a discussion between two or more people. Resendez said he likes to hear a small amount of sound in the class because if the students are talking, they are thinking. John Resendez added that an important part of communicating is seeing other people's facial expressions and body language. 
teaching is especially difficult for those who work with students with hearing difficulties or students who do not speak English as their first language. Some sounds can become more difficult to hear when spoken through a mask. Deborah Short is president of the TESOL International Association. The Virginia-based group connects teachers who teach English to speakers of other languages. She said, For one, the mask might muffle some sounds, making it harder for English learners to distinguish them, such as the sound for P and the sound for B. Short said teachers can reduce these problems by speaking loudly and clearly. They also can use videos and images to show how sounds may be created, she explained. Some schools have ordered clear plastic coverings so that students can see teachers' mouths. Wanser said one teacher wore such a mask while working with a student who has hearing difficulties. The student said the mask was unnecessary. The teacher was happy not to use it, she said, because the plastic material was so uncomfortable. Still, teachers and schools are behind the increased demand for clear masks from companies like Baltimore-based Clear Mask. Elisa Dittmar is Clear Mask's co-founder and president. The company began making clear masks after Dittmar, who is deaf, was unable to communicate well with a traditional mask while undergoing surgery. We see a large need for early childhood education to support young children's social, emotional, and language development, as well as specific programs for students, Dittmar said. At the C.B. Jennings International Elementary Magnet School in New London, Connecticut, teachers get carts with protective windows. Carts are small wheeled tables that are pushed. Teachers can stand behind these carts as they move around the classroom. But even while standing behind the carts, many teachers still keep their masks on, noted Elizabeth Sked. She added that expressive eyes help teachers connect with students. Belinda Williams is a teacher at Webb Elementary School in Franklin, Indiana. She said she and her young students have become used to wearing masks, social distancing, and regular hand cleaning. Williams put superhero images in her classroom. She tells students they have special powers when they are wearing face coverings. Do I wish we didn't have to wear a mask? Absolutely, she said. But if it means teaching our children in person, then I will do what it takes. I'm John Russell. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. From VOA Learning English. 
Welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. In November of 1840, the American people elected William Henry Harrison as their ninth president. Harrison was a retired general and a well-known Indian fighter. Many people considered him a hero for his victory over Native Americans at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811. Americans elected John Tyler as Harrison's vice president. The two men ran on the campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Harrison was the first president from the Whig Party. Some Whig leaders, including Senators Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, believed they could control the newly elected president. Harrison asked Daniel Webster to edit the speech he planned to give after the swearing-in ceremonies. Webster removed some material from the inaugural speech and suggested other changes. The inauguration took place on March 4, 1841. It was the coldest inaugural day in the nation's history. Harrison spoke on the front steps of the Capitol building. He gave the longest inaugural address of any president. It lasted almost two hours. But Harrison did not wear a winter overcoat or hat. He got sick, probably from standing so long outside in the cold. Rest was his best treatment. But the new president was so busy, he had little time to rest. Harrison's health grew worse. Late in March 1841, he developed pneumonia. Doctors did everything they could to cure him, but nothing seemed to help. On April 4th, exactly one month after he became president, William Henry Harrison died. Vice President John Tyler was then at his home in Williamsburg, Virginia. Daniel Webster, the new Secretary of State, sent his son on horseback to tell Tyler of the President's death. The Vice President was shocked. He had not even known that Harrison was sick. Two hours after he received the news, Tyler was on his way to Washington. There was some question about Tyler's official duties. Harrison's death marked the first time that a president had died in office. No one was sure what the Constitution meant when it said that the powers of a deceased president should go to the vice president. Eventually, Tyler, Webster, and other cabinet members decided that Tyler should be president and serve until the next election. That was a very controversial claim because people said, no, he's not the president, he's an acting president. He's just temporarily filling the office, but he's not president. Historian Michael Holt taught at the University of Virginia. He says, although not everyone supported John Tyler's claim, he set an important example. He showed how power could transfer peacefully to the vice president after a U.S. president died in office. Tyler was sworn in as the nation's 10th president on April 6, 1841. He was 51 years old. No other man had become president at such an early age. Tyler was a slaveholding Southerner. He was born and grew up in the same part of Virginia as William Henry Harrison. 
His father was a wealthy landowner and judge who had been a friend of Thomas Jefferson. Tyler completed studies at the College of William and Mary and became a lawyer. He entered politics and served in the Virginia State Legislature. Then he was elected a member of Congress and later governor of Virginia. He also served as a member of the United States Senate. Tyler believed strongly in the rights of the states. As a congressman and a senator, he had voted against every attempt to give more power to the federal government. In fact, historian Michael Holt says that in many ways, Tyler was more like a member of the Democrats, the opposing party at the time. He favored the typical position of Democrats on what we could call domestic policy, which is that government is best which governs least. The, the less federal domestic policy you have trying to generate economic growth or improve society or whatever, the better. In comparison, many Whig Party members firmly supported the ideas of a national bank, a protective tax on imports, and federal spending to improve transportation in the states. Tyler was just as firmly against these ideas. At the same time, many Democrats did not like the president either. Most Democrats regarded him as a traitor who had jumped from the Jackson party and joined the Whigs, however temporarily. Michael Holt says even Tyler's appearance made him seem difficult and unpleasant. You look at this guy and he's sort of aesthetically thin and, and with sunken cheeks and a long pointed nose. He just looks like he's unhappy with the world. <laughs> President Tyler quickly became even more unpopular over the issue of a new national bank. He wanted to establish such a bank in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. The national bank could open offices in a state, but only if the state approved. Tyler's proposal was not the kind of bank most Whigs in Congress supported. They wanted no limits of any kind on the power of a national bank to open offices anywhere in the country. Whigs in Congress suggested a compromise. Bank offices would be permitted in any state where the state legislature did not immediately refuse permission. But President Tyler vetoed the compromise. He sent the bank bill back to Congress. The congressman wrote another bill. They said it was exactly what the president wanted. But the president did not agree. He said the states must have the right to approve or reject bank offices. He said this second bill would also be vetoed unless changes were made in it. The changes were not made, and Tyler did as he said he would do. He vetoed it. The decision created a crisis in the cabinet. All the president's advisors but one, Daniel Webster, resigned. Michael Holt says that several days later, most cabinet members and a large group of other Whig congressmen voted to expel Tyler from the party. They read this paper saying he's no Whig. Don't blame us for all of his vetoes. Harrison appointed a new cabinet of Whigs he hoped would be more friendly to him, but after a while, they too resigned. Michael Holt says 
Tyler made more changes in his cabinet than any other U.S. president. President Tyler struggled with his party over other issues. One was about import taxes. Two years into Tyler's presidency, the government found itself short of money. It was spending more than it had. Congress decided that import taxes should be raised, some even higher than 20%. But President Tyler vetoed the bill. He said it was wrong to raise the tax so high and, at the same time, continue to give the states money from land sales. He said the federal government itself needed the land sale money. Michael Holt says once again the Whigs were angry. Their party controlled both houses of Congress and the White House, but they could not reach their goals. The Whigs were elected with this agenda that they wanted Congress to pass, that they had promised would rescue the country from a very serious depression. And this included a new national bank, higher tariffs, distribution of federal revenues from public land sales. President Tyler, he adds, frustrated the entire Whig legislative program. It was clear the Whigs would not nominate him for the next election, so Tyler turned his attention to the Democrats. He hoped they would ask him to be their presidential candidate in 1844. Tyler began appointing Democratic advisors to his cabinet, and he gave his support to one of the Democrats' causes, making Texas a state in the Union. Texas was an independent nation at the time. Some Americans wanted to bring Texas into the United States to further expand the country. But others were afraid that the territory would permit slavery. They wanted to keep an equal balance between slaveholding and non-slaveholding states. President Tyler had the opposite fear. Michael Holt explains that Tyler was afraid that Texas would remain an independent republic and abolish slavery there. He and other Southerners thought that that was a terrible idea. But he also believed that this is what's going to put him in the history books, that he's going to be responsible for adding this enormous republic of Texas, although it wasn't quite as big as what they claimed, to the United States. I'm Steve Ember, inviting you to join us next time for The Making of a Nation, American History from VOA Learning English. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 